50, for the five to 50 minutes, and then leave the other 10 minutes for Q and A. So what I intend to do in this session, as usual, we'll look at our learning outcome, meaning at the end of this session, what do we inshallah intend to achieve? And then the types of market structure that we have today, the major ones, and our focus will be on the perfect competitive market because this is the market which uh, uh, many of us use today. And then we look at these market assumptions and then we see the fifth views on this market and then we conclude the session. So moving forward, inshallah at the end of this session, we are expected to explain the different market structures uh, especially for those who do not come from economics background, but for those who come from economic background, I think it should be something simple for them. And then we should be able to explain the market assumptions, and then we should be able to appreciate the relationship between FIC uh, and the market. Now, moving forward, we know that today there are four basic structures of the market what we call the monopolistic competition. And then we have the monopoly and the oligopoly, and then the perfect uh, competition, which will be our focus. Now, when you look at the differences in this market structure, for example, in terms of market uh, characteristics, the perfect market usually have large numbers of relatively small firms. And most of their products are standardized, which in fact we call it Mithili. Mithili, for those who study fit, is called Mithili. That means they are standardized. Uh, in other words, you'll find the same uh, products everywhere. If you want to buy a pen, you'll find many shops selling similar pens, similar books, uh, similar kinds of uh, products that you need. And then the market entry is usually very easy. And then non-price competition is almost impossible, according to them. Non-price competition are things like advertisements and things like uh, gifts uh, that you give to people, things like product development. And so it's almost impossible because these firms uh, focus on those areas. And then they don't have market power. But when you come to monopolistic competition, uh, these are basically large farms of relatively uh, large number of relatively small farms. Uh, they could be in terms of, you know, selling textiles, they could be restaurants, they could be TV programs, uh, etc. And their program, uh, products are usually differentiated and it's also easy to enter this market. Now, the other one is the oligopoly, which are basically small numbers. You find them among competing large firms. Uh, they could be car uh, sellers, those selling Toyota, etc., cetera, um, or even Ford. And then you have also cell phone providers in this group. And the monopoly usually are those with one, which are one seller. Uh, normally you find in many of our Muslim countries, uh, you find uh, uh, certain utility providers like electricity, water, etc. They tend to be monopolies. Mm -hmm. So now the market mechanism in all this, uh, basically the focus is on price signals. And apparently, subhanAllah, it seems this is also our behavior today. Uh, we are driven by prices. Uh, and this is also true for Islamic banking and finance and economics. We are driven by prices. Uh, when you see an advertisement saying sale, 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 the immediate thing people look at are prices, price signals. Mm -hmm. And when they go to the banks to access products, they want to buy houses, they want to buy facilities. The first thing they ask the bank is what price do you offer? Mm -hmm. And so apparently it seems we are more driven by price signals, just like the conventional market says. But what is more paramount for a Muslim that uh, more fundamental than the price is the issue of um, Sharia compliance. 
uh, whether something is halal or haram, even before you think about the price. And I don't know how many Muslims, when they go to these, uh, to our banks, uh, go to any organizations, go to any shops, whether the first question they ask is about halal and haram. Many of them, they'll just immediately look at the price. So when you look at the price signal, then we fall in the category of what the conventional talks about price signals. And then the second thing is they say that we are rational, rationality, we always need more and more and more. And so try to assess yourself whether you fall in this category of the conventional assessment of our behavior in terms of price signals and rationality. Now, our focus, as I said, will be on the perfect uh, competitive market. Now, this word perfect is a misnomer. Perfect means just and fair. They say our market today is just and fair. And this reminds me of Professor Garudi, who says today the market and sense becomes the faith, the religion of many people. Uh, people believe so much in the market, believe so much in the science, uh, that sometimes it becomes very difficult to, to convince them that this thing also have certain you know, limitations in them. So when they talk about perfect competition, they talk about just and fair market. And the conventional, the secular economists, particularly the neoclassical economics, they assume that for the market to be perfect, to be uh, meaning just and fair, we have to meet those four assumptions. Now, what is an assumption? An assumption is part of the truth, uh, meaning, uh, let's say somebody uh, is absent uh, from an event, or there may be those who could not attend this webinar today, so what are the possibilities? The possibilities are that they might have been caught up in other businesses, or some of them may not be feeling well. Some of them have a problem with their system. So all these are true. Mm -hmm. So if we pick up only one part of the truth and say, assuming that their system is not working, then this becomes an assumption which helps us in our analysis. But we must also bear in mind that when you make assumptions, assumptions must be realistic. So one of the argument people put for the neoclassical school is that much of their assumptions tend not to be realistic. In other words, they don't reflect the reality of how people behave. And we look at that. Uh, one is that for a perfect competitive market, there has to be many buyers and sellers and then the goods have to be homogeneous. That means similar goods uh, most of the time. And people who want to enter the market should end freely, and those who want to exist, they should exist freely. Now take this third assumption. Is it really true applying today? We see many trade wars uh, between big powers, take for example, China and America. Uh, do they fit in the free entry and free exit? Many of our developing countries tend to come up with restrictions to protect their domestic uh, industry. And these restrictions are justified for them to prosper. So the idea of making assumptions that there's free entry and exit may be theoretically true, but in reality, they don't really hold true. Now, the other thing they said is there has to be no information uh, asymmetry. That means whatever the buyers know, the sellers know. If you go to buy handphones, they say the information you know is the same as the seller knows. But we know in reality, usually the seller knows more about the phone than the buyers. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll sell you an old phone, even you don't know whether it is old or new. Huh? And in the fifth term, we call it al-jahala. Huh? So we usually have that ignorance. In other words, the information are not shared correctly. So the idea of these assumptions and then the idea of competition is at the crux of our discussion on fiqh. Now, let us take first the idea of the assumption before we go to competition. Now, these assumptions, you see the four, 
if you come to the box down, you see that these assumptions have ignored those ethical values. In other words, if we assume that all these are true, still the market will not be perfect. That is why many of the global economic and financial crisis happening, many of the literature and writing shows that the reasons behind these crises is because of ethical issues. Uh, things like greed, people have become greedy. People no longer care for one another. People just want to maximize profit. The issue of corruptions, the issue of leakages. And these are the main issues which undermines what we call main issues that undermine a uh, just and fair market. So in Islam, or in fifth term, some of those ethical values are things like riba, like ghara, like maisir, which we'll discuss some of them in detail shortly. So in other words, the issues that undermine just and fair market from an Islamic perspective are basically the presence of riba, which in convention they call it interest, and then uh, the issue of ghara, uh, which is uncertainty in the market, uh, things related to what we call unnecessary risks in the market, and my seal speculation and gambling in the market. These are the core issues that really uh, many studies prove have undermined perfect competition and which is at the core of our field. Hmm? Then the other thing which is very interesting is competition. In Islam, we talk about competition with cooperation. Hmm? Just let me tell you a very interesting story, just for a few minutes. There was one guy who was working in UK and he was a very good manager. So he came to Saudi Arabia and working for, um, what do you call it? Working for a perfume company. Uh, so he started working for that company. And then after some time, there was another company competitor that came next to them next door. Uh, so that company also sells perfumes and wants to establish a shop next to the shop where this British uh, guy is working. And so when they started building the shop, the owner of this perfume company, uh, let us say company X, uh, the owner of company X told the British guy that you help the workers of company Y. They may need food, they need water. So this British guy is surprised why this is our competitor and you want us to give water and food to them. Anyway, no problem. So he started giving water and food. So they managed to construct the building very quickly and they started the business next to them, company Y, company X. Then over time, company Y ran into debt. And so the British guy was very happy and says, okay, now we are not going to have a competitor. This guy is soon going to be wiped out from the market. So when he told the boss, so the boss called, the boss of company X called the boss of company Y and say, I heard you're having difficulties with the business. He says, yes, I'm in huge debt. He says, how much is your debt? He says, so much million. He says, okay, I'll send the check to settle your debt and you continue with your business. So he told his British guy that, please, manager, send, you know, settle their debt. So this guy could not stomach this. It's too much for him. He says, look, your boss, can I tell you something? Yes. He says, in UK, we don't do competition this way. Uh, you see, we are very happy this guy is already going out of business. Why do you want to support him? And he will be our competitor and we will have no, you know, customer to come by. Then the manager, the chef of company X says, look here, my son, this company and our company, the person who provides the risk, the person who provides the sustenance is Allah. They cannot stop our risk and we cannot stop their risk. In fact, we benefit a lot by supporting them because we open the door. If you help others, Allah will widen your risk. 
So we are helping them because our dean says, when we compete, we have to cooperate. In others, in Islam, there's competition with cooperation. And so you find during the early days of Islam, the Sahab and after even some of the Tabi'een, when you have three shops, when a customer come in the first shop, he buys. When the next customer come in the first shop, the first shop will send him to the second shop. So they will ensure that all the three shops first had customers, only then they continue their business. In other words, when you talk about the Islamic perspective of competition, it is basically about competition with cooperation. Rather than having that envy, you want to do away with your competitors, you want to see them, you know, getting wiped out from the market. This is not a fundamental concept of Islam. In Islam, you need to help others to grow and Allah will widen our, our risk. So this is very fundamental when we look at these two perspectives, competition with cooperation and then the assumptions of ethical values to ensure that we have a just and fair market. Now, the market has some failures. The failures in the market are usually when the private goals do not match the societal goals. And most of the time this happens where companies tend to be, you know, look at their self-interest as we study in conventional economics. You just pursue your self-interest. So what do we do? We create pollution. And of course, at the core, we see a lot of corruptions happening even in Muslim society, these are all due to, you know, uh, a mismatch between the private goals and societal goals. And other externalities include things like fraud, mm, uh, things like the police, deceptions, etc. So these are the fundamental background when we look at those market determinants and um, implications. Now let us look at the fifth on the market. So from fit on the market, we'll be looking at three important concepts uh, because of the time constraint. Uh, this is a session which is very, very big, requires more than one hour, but I'm just trying to uh, capsulate them into, you know, within these 40 minutes. So we'll be looking at three factors, that is halal and haram, and then we'll be looking at riba, and we'll be looking at al isra mm -hmm. And these are very fundamental when we talk about economics today. Uh, whether they are in trading, whether they're in banking, whether they're in any system, you cannot run away from halal and haram, and you cannot run away from the issue of riba and the issue of al-israf, uh, these fundamental areas. Now let us look at halal and haram. We find in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was uh, uh, narrated by Abdullah ibn Uman, the Prophet وسلم, says, In al halala bayin, wa in al harama bayin, wa bayinahuma umurun mushtabihad, la yala muhunna kathirun min al nas. That halal is clear and haram is clear. And between halal and haram, there are gray areas. And many people, and that's very interesting part of the hadith many people really are not aware of these gray areas. They are only aware about halal and haram, but the gray areas are where many people fall into that. So if you look at my diagram here, I have two interesting edge. This edge are not hospitals, but they're halal and haram. You have the green halal and the red haram. If you see in this first diagram, the gap is very small. And in my second diagram, it's a very big gap. Why this gap is small, this is the time of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba. They ensure that the gray areas is not expanded. They focus, they ensure that halal and haram are very clear. And I'm sure many of you can remember the story of Abu Bakr uh, where one of his maid servants brought for him food. And when he put the first uh, food in his mouth, the first you know, uh, intake of that food, then he asked his uh, maid, where did you get it from? So the maid told him where he got it from and he discovered that it's not something halal. So Abu Bakr anhu 
try to put his he put his hand in his mouth uh, to invoke vomiting. So he vomited so much that people thought Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was going to die. Subhanallah, imagine uh, you know this uh, Sahaba not wanting even a drop of haram in their body because they know that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that kullu jismin or jasidin that everybody which consumes haram, that body becomes the first body that deserves to go to Jahannam, and may Allah save us from that. And we find people like Al Imam Malik, rahimahullah, when he goes to the market, he buys chicken, he brings the chicken at home, and makes sure that he raises the chicken for four days. He feeds the chicken grains for four days to change the system of the chicken before he slaughters the chicken. Now you can imagine how this, uh, our scholars and the Sahaba were so concerned about halal and haram to the extent that they ensure their transactions, uh, whatever they eat uh, and whatever they have among their family members should really be halal. But today, unfortunately, you can look at this gap. The gap between halal and haram is widening. Mm -hmm. And uh, to some extent also, some of our you know, scholars are to blame because we tend to give you know, simplistic fatwas. Uh, we tend to you know, make other people happy uh, other than pleasing Allah. So uh, in the name of maslaha, in the name of barura, we keep on widening this gap between halal and haram. And may Allah save the Ummah. Hmm. So now let us look at our riba very quickly. Uh, I have uh, still 20 minutes, inshallah, I'll try to finish this. Now, interest or banking interest is basically part of riba. Riba is bigger than interest. And I'll go very slowly and later we'll see what this riba is. Now, these are the common justification people give for charging interest. Uh, both in conventional and sometimes also we find Muslim scholars tend to justify that to charge interest because interest is an incentive for you to save and invest money. Uh, interest is an opportunity cost. Interest is a time value of money and then interest is like renting money. Uh, so look at each one of them very quickly one by one. Uh, it's really interest and incentives for savings and investment. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, today, believe me, we are in coronavirus. Many banks are even giving negative interest. Many are even giving zero. And see the number of people borrowing. Huh? Many people do not even want to borrow. They don't want to do business. Why? Because business investments and savings are based on expectations. If your expectations are gloomy, regardless of what the interest rate is, you cannot save or invest. Mm -hmm. So many studies have proven that it is not true to say people save or invest because of interest rate. On the contrary, it is based on the, uh, the expectation mm -hmm. of what we look in the future. And there are a lot of studies on that. And then opportunity cost. What's an opportunity cost? Opportunity cost is what you forego. Uh, uh, for example, if you have two investment, investment A and investment B, if you choose to invest in a company A, then your opportunity cost is company B. That means the cost of the opportunity that you left. Now, in the conventional economics, most of the opportunity costs are market and they are also material. Example we gave is company A and company B. Company A and B both are material and companies A and B both are market. So when they compare opportunity costs, they compare for market material and market material. But from an Islamic perspective, some of our comparison can also be between material and market versus non-market, non-material. For example, Allah tells us in Al-Quran, Surah Al-Jum'ah, verse number nine, 
ما دعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اذا نودي للصلاه من يوم الجمعه فاسعوا الى ذكر الله وذروا البيع if you hear adhan call for prayers you go to prayers and then leave your business for a while so in other words the quran is giving a comparison between business which is market and material and prayer which is non-market non-material so which one is the highest opportunity cost the quran explains to us and tells us this is the highest opportunity cost for you if only you know now what are the implications in that the implication is that in our islamic economics and finance we have certain products for example qard, loan loan when you give out loan the opportunity cost of giving out loan is supposed to be non-material non-market because you are going to get your reward to allah or from allah in the hereafter so if you give out loan you don't expect material returns so instead of you using that money to invest somewhere else the opportunity cost of getting that investment is in the hereafter but unfortunately we have some people who tend to get material benefit from this loan in the name of service charge in the name of all the charges in the world so this becomes riba huh? because what you earn from them should be non-material non-market and you get your reward from allah in the hereafter now moving forward renting money and many of us know that money in islam is a medium of exchange so when conventional they say they rent uh, in your fit i'm sure you study that there are two kinds of assets um, one which is gives you the complete uh, we call it al milkiya tamma uh, complete ownership where the assets you own both the assets and the user rights user fraud is something which generates uh, uh, you know benefits from in between uh. now what's the difference between user fraud and services uh, take for example mothers our mothers hmm? when a mother has a baby the mother breastfeeds the baby the milk comes from the mother this is called user fraud at the same time also the mother cleans the baby in other words she provides something outside which does not come inside from her but outside this is called services so services are things that are from without and user for comes from within and this is called uh, uh, that is why we have an ijara al ijara is because of this user for or al ijara is because of services and money does not produce user for from within it's just a legal tender where we give it a value mm -hmm. so it cannot be justified then we come to the idea of time value of money now in islam when we talk about time value of money we talk about actual time value of money that means money participates in the process of production mm -hmm. let us say you are producing a table you took one week to produce to produce that table so one week and two weeks can be factored into the cost that person will look the time two weeks can factor into the pricing the other person will take one week to factor in the pricing because there's an actual you know uh, actual uh, time value within that production but what we see in the conventional is they use what we call uh, artificial time value of money mm -hmm. the simple is where you have this future value is equal to present value one plus i which is interest and n okay and this mostly they use to price uh, their products huh? uh, mostly for loan whether you want housing loan you want car loans etc loan so they price them based on this and this pricing is usually based it is done on the liability side of the balance sheet that means they look at the cost of capital it has nothing to do with the value of the products hmm? so the focus is on the cost of the capital so let us take these two components which is future value and present value 
future value and present value mean different to different people. Let us take, for example, a lady who is earning uh, 10,000 Indonesian rupiah or 100 Malaysian ringgit, mm -hmm. uh, or even uh, Naira, what we call it, uh, this uh, Nigerian currency. Mm -hmm. So this sweeper, if you take that money, 100 from her, and tell her, I will give you after one week, she will feel the pain. She said, oh, one week, can you return it early and all this? Because the, as you go more to the future, that value becomes higher and higher to her presently. But go to a billionaire who has, you know, huge amount of money and say, can you give me a hundred ringgit or 10,000 rupiah? Then you ask him or her, when should I return it? Says, please, anytime you wish. Hmm? So future value and present value mean different to different people. You cannot lump some them together and say this is what people you know feel when they talk about present and future value the other second thing is i interest rate is usually a policy variable uh, and today look people can decide on interest rate at will when america increases interest rates many countries are forced to do the same otherwise they have capital flights from their countries mm -hmm. so it's a policy variable then n which we see up here it's a precondition and varies with loan amount, hence it is Riba and Nasir. When you ask people to pay you back based on time, then this we call it Riba and Nasir. This is what it was in Jahiliya. Uh, people used to borrow money, then they are not able to pay. They say extend the loan period. And when we extend the loan period, you have to pay more. So this is what our banks do today. They say, how long do you need the loan? He says, five years, you pay this much. 10 years, this much. 20 years, this much. So the loan varies with time, not with the value of the product. So this is called Riva and Nasir. Hmm? Now, that is why you find in Quran, Surah al Nisa, uh, it warned the, the Jews against Riva that don't charge Riva. And so this is the kind of riba that they charge, used to be riba nasia, which is also mentioned in the Bible. And in Surah Ali Imran, they talk about redoubling riba, something similar to the so-called compound uh, interest, uh, where you add more and more. Each year, the interest compounds. Mm? So what is the concept of this riba? I'm left with another... 15 minutes, inshallah, I should be in time. What is the concept of this riba? Now, a hadith narrated by Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, he says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that Laina, there's a curse to Akil riba, a person who consumes riba, who eats riba, and also a curse upon a person who feeds others riba, and then also the one who bears witness of the riba, and then also to a person who documents riba. And that is why some people come and ask me and say, uh, can I work in conventional banks? You saw I'm very much in difficulty. Uh, the difficulty is that you will fall under all these four categories. In fact, falling under these four categories is more difficult than your situation of joining those banks. Uh, because what does la'na means in Arabic? When you have la'na from Allah or curse from Allah, it means the door of rahmah of Allah is closed on you. The door of his mercy is closed. And this is a very strong term. A Muslim should never reach a level where you have the curse of Allah. That means you're finished. And you could see how, you know, people take riba very, you know, very lightly. But wallahi you will find that many of our problems today is because of this riba. Many of the problems today. Because if you don't have the rahm of Allah, that means your health is at stake, your family is at stake, your business in future is at stake, a lot of things, believe me or not, it will come at a time when you will lose everything because there's no rahm, whether you like it or not. Huh? So it's not an easy thing when you talk about riba. It's not, 
is not an intellectual exercise, it's not a mental exercise. It's something real that affects our life. So we should not take it, you know, something literally, <coughs> which is easy. So what is the illa of riba? Now, the word illa is very interesting here. Illa is reason. Hmm? And I like to draw these examples to my students that you come to a traffic light and the light is red. Hmm? What do you do? And uh, I remember some of my students saying, sir, we stop. I said, that's very good. But others say, you know, I will look left and right. And uh, if there are no cars, I just uh, move. Huh? Then I told them a story of a gentleman who looked left and right. There was no car. He moved. And suddenly the police traffic was after, you know, his tail with a motorbike. Stop, stop, stop. Did you see red traffic light? Yes, sir. Then why didn't you stop, sir? Because I did not see you. So he did not see the traffic uh, <laughs> police. Huh? So you should not be in that category. So when you see a traffic light, you stop. Okay. Why did you stop? When I asked my students, some were giving interesting reasons. Some say, sir, because it's a law. Others say, it's because, you know, I'm afraid of accident. And others say, uh, you know, because um, uh, you, you need to, you know, observe that there is a system. And then I told them, whatever you're saying is called hikmah. It is the wisdom behind the rule. Mm -hmm. But your real reason to stop is because of the red light. Normally when people see traffic lights, they don't stop by saying, uh, you know, I may have an accident, I'm stopping. Uh, people don't do that. They just see red light immediately, they stop on the brake because they see the red light. Hmm? So that is the illa. Whatever is the reason behind your stopping is called hekma or the wisdom uh, behind it. So for illa in Sharia to be called illa, it must be consistent. That means wherever you see a red light, you stop. Wherever you see a red light, you stop, then it becomes illa. If it keeps on changing, then it's not illa. Now, I want to give a very interesting story, which happened in 2008. And it was by the founder of Grameen Bank, uh, Professor Muhammad Yunus. He came to the International Islamic University of Malaysia. So he was giving a talk on the microfinance in Bangladesh. So one of the students, a female student, asked a question and said, Professor, why do you take interest on your loan in Bangladesh when you provide this microfinance and knowing very well you are a Muslim and also knowing that riba is considered haram in Islam. And the sister quoted Surah Al-Baqarah, which many of you memorize, wa Allahu al-bay'ah, wa al riba So Professor Yunus replied and said, you know, sister, I consulted my Sharia board members and uh, they say that the interest rate we are charging is very, very small. And so since it is minimal and it is not exploitative, therefore it is not riba. So we wanted to rebut, but there was no time given. So I promised myself I would write an article. And I wrote an article and mentioned this incident in my article, which was also translated in Indonesian language. Hmm? Now, I went through the research to look at what is it that the professor say is not exploitative. I found that they were charging 30 to 60% per annum uh, to those poor guys who are given this loan from Grameen Bank. Then I said, if 30 to 60 is not exploitative, then the interest rate at that time in Malaysia was around uh, three point something to four. Then I said, then we have to halalize all conventional banks if 30 and 60 is not exploitative. Therefore, my conclusion was that the reason given for the prohibition of riba as exploitative is not consistent. So, uh, exploitation cannot be the illa of riba. So the real illa of riba is any excess on loan. And the word is unjustified excess in loan. Whether they are material or non-material, this is considered as riba. Unjustified excess in loan. Whether they are material or non-material is riba. Take for example, our Imam, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. And Imam Abu Hanifa was coming uh, from a mosque and it was very, very hot sun in Iraq. So people were taking shade from one house. So they said, yeah, Imam, 
come and take shade in the house. So Al Imam Abu Hanifa says, No, I will not come. Why, yeah, Imam? He says, Because the person you're taking shade from his house, this is my debtor. I lent money to him. If I take shade from his house, this is extra benefit above my loan, and that is riba. Subhanallah. Look at those people who understand <clears throat> the real meaning of riba. That means any extra unjustified excess is considered as riba. <clears throat> So what are those moral ills or what we call wisdom? Because only Allah knows the wisdom of Reba. But what appears to us is what we see happening in writings and evidences. Hmm? And for a Muslim, whether there is hikmah or no hikmah, when Allah says this is haram, as we discussed in the previous class, is part of your aqidah tawheed to say, sami'na wa atana. Ya Allah, we listen and we just obey regardless of what the reason is, regardless of what the justification is, and that is the position of a Muslim. So studies show that riba creates income inequality, and since riba is based on debt, and many of you are scholars and you do research, and you can see the degree of indebtedness. And we have this simple Keynesian model. It says when you have your disposable income, either you consume that income or you save. So saving means you are sacrificing your current consumption for your future generation. The more you sacrifice your consumption, the more your future generation becomes better and better. That's why when the Prophet Sallallahu advised Sa'ad ibn Waqas, he says, save your Sa'ad, because if you save money, you make your generation better and better, rather than making them poor. Hmm? It's better to leave your future generation rich rather than leaving them poor, begging people. What does debt do? Debt brings future consumption now. That means the more debt you take, the more you inherit indebtedness to your future and future generations. So they become poorer and poorer. And that is true for individuals, true for family, and true for nations, also countries. Uh, take the case, somebody was talking the case of Congo. Hmm? They borrowed 50 million, and because of interest, they had to pay 5 billion within a certain period of time. Now imagine how you inherit those five billion interests to a generation that will be poorer and poorer as they go along. Also, interest has psychological strength. And unfortunately for interest, and because many people borrow, we actually work to live. Huh? Do you work to live or you live to work? So many of us are living because we have to work and lend huh? and pay those debts. But we are not working because we want to live a healthy life. On the contrary, we are living to work for those that. And many of us begin to enjoy our houses and cars at the age of 65, 70. How many years you have to live? Maybe 10 years. I met one of the rich men guy. All his children, mashallah, had houses. When he became sick, he said, Wallah, I didn't know why, you know, I invested in all these houses. I just needed one room, actually. <laughs> I don't need all this. All my children are not with me. So, subhanAllah, if you can afford, by all means, Wallah, buy. Because it's the name of Allah. But if you cannot afford, there's no sense, you know, to tire out your entire life because you think that uh, your future lies only in those cars and houses. Hmm? And then also it creates exploitation and injustices, creates business cycles, and then it instills greed and envy. This is what Riba does. Hmm? So let me move very quickly. I have only five minutes left. Then the next one is an Israf in at tabdir Now, what is the difference between these two? The difference is that Israf is a waste. Usually Israf uh, connects to things that are halal. But the excess that you give out, the excess that you do is haram. And tabdir is when you put your resources or you consume something that is not required, it is called tabdir. And 
cigarette, for example, you spend 50 cents on cigarettes. It may be small, but cigarette is not required. So it becomes the beer. Hmm? And usually now the amount of waste that we have in food and uh, there are new views on circular economy that some of these things can be recycled into new products, can be recycled to help people, but still Allah does not love those who do Israf and those who do Tabdir. In other words, we must try as much as possible to ensure that we avoid waste. And waste is not only in food, waste in terms of you know, time, waste in words. That's why the Prophet says, two things people are usually at loss. People usually lose time and they lose their health. So we need also not to waste our time. We don't need to waste those resources which Allah gives to us. We don't need also to waste our, our health. And finally, I'm moving very quickly within these three minutes. But during the time of the Prophet وسلم, he instituted what we call Al-Hizbah, uh, Al-Hizbah institution. Al-Hizbah basically means uh, Muhasaba accountability. And that institution was very fundamental, not only in observing the practices in the market, but setting standards in the market. And the objective of this Al-Hizbah was Al-Amru bil Ma'aruf wa Nahi an al-Munkar, enjoining what is good and forbidding what is evil. And today you have in few Scandinavian countries they have al hizba called ombudsman. Huh? So what was the role of al hizba al hizba ensured that people inculcated positive values and they tried to prohibit those negative values. For example, uh, the Prophet wasallam would go around the market to ensure that there was no fraud, uh, there was no deception, uh, and people were caring for one another, people were helping one another, and in fact, during the time of the Khulafa al Rashid, in particular Sayyidina Umar uh, radiallahu anhu, uh, this al Hizba started to ensure that the basic needs in the market were provided. Uh, they also ensured that, um, uh, apart from the basic needs, the right industry was provided in the market. The market used good measures uh, and weights. Uh, they ensured that the market was free from riba was free from Muharrar and all the other negative uh, elements. So to conclude, therefore, uh, the assumptions that we found for fair markets uh, from an Islamic perspective, fifth perspective must include those ethical values, uh, inculcating good values and prohibiting those values like riba, gharar, and myself. And we know that fear in the market is directed towards prohibiting negative values and promoting positive values, like we saw that the Prophet وسلم, instituted al hizba to ensure that uh, the market runs smoothly according to the values of uh, al Islam. Uh, so, this uh, concludes my uh, presentation, and I leave the remaining 10 minutes, inshallah, for questions and answers. Uh, and I'll be sending also these um, uh, slides to uh, Brother Shahran uh, to share it uh, with all of you. So now I welcome your, your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, we take a first question from Brother Abdullahi Ibrahim. What are the outline conditions of giving out loan? and considering the status of individual in that of Islam. And second one, do we have collateral in Islam when giving out loan? Okay, that's a very good question. Now here there are two kinds of uh, <coughs> loan that you talk about. I'm using the word qard. Qard huh? is very important to use. And then there are what we call business financing. Uh, so these are two different things. Business financing is different from qard. <coughs> al qard is usually you give it out of needs. Hmm? You give it out of needs and you have a lot of uh, definitions in the fiqh books, in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu When people are in dire need, they come, they need qard. Huh? And usually the best form of qard is called qard hasan, where you give to people and uh, you may not expect them to pay back. 
And usually the condition are these are people who are really very, very uh, poor or they are very much in need. They not necessarily be poor, but they are really in dire need and then they need that help. Hmm? This is called help. And this card has no uh, collateral, has no collateral in it. And uh, because it is for the purpose of helping your Muslim brothers and sisters, and uh, especially when there is no zakah funds to help this kind of people, or they cannot get borrowed, this is called card. Now the other one is called uh, uh, Dane in business, Dane in business, meaning that people come for financing, they want to buy something, and they do not have sufficient fund to buy that thing and they want to pay by installment. And since the asset that they buy is very huge, so usually they place collateral. And this collateral is important for them also because the issue of Dain is very, very fundamental because if they cannot pay on the day of Qiyamah, they will be asked. So people will come with collateral, they want to buy houses, they want to buy cars. So it is also to manage the risks uh, between the person who provide financing. I don't want to use the word lending because if you say the word lending, then there's nothing called lending in business. Hmm? In Islam, either you buy something and sell it to the other person or you have a partnership in business. Huh? So lending is only qard when you lend as a loan. So usually, although people talk about qard hasan in business, uh, there are debates about it because by giving qard hasan in business means you guarantee your capital just like a conventional and if there's a profit or loss still that person has to pay uh, that cap on you know on, on the loan so i would prefer to use the word financing and i would prefer to use the word buying and selling uh, and later we'll be looking at this during the course of our discussion whether you're using murabaha which is you buy and sell it to people or you are using uh, musharaka partnership and there's something called musharaka mutanaqisa where the provider of the fund and the customer, they jointly buy the asset. And then slowly by slowly, the customer continues to redeem the equity. The equity of the provider of finance decreases or diminishes, and then the equity of the person buying or the customer keeps on increasing. This is called diminishing partnership. So there are a lot of facilities in an Islamic uh, uh, finance and banking where you can do buying and selling. So I want uh, the audience to differentiate between qard, which is loan in money, and something which is called dain. In fact, dain is a bigger picture. Under dain, you have qard, and under dain, which is created by sale. Uh, so dain created by sale is where people uh, pay by installment, and there you need collateral uh, for that kind of dain. I hope it explains the uh what uh, the brother is asking for <laughs> okay prof uh, we take another one by brother mustafa Mukhtar with a general question mm -hmm. in case where it is a multi-religious society and the fund federal government gives to support startups micro medium entrepreneurs and small-scale businesses was mostly funded in riba terms and condition can we muslim benefit from such fund as darura or we should just leave it Okay, that's a very interesting question <clears throat> because here is, um, I think this is a classical question which people usually ask, not only for those who receive the funds, but also for those who give out the fund. Now, I think the definition of darura doesn't fit here well. Uh, my view will be the extreme view that Muslims need to create uh, their own funding. A typical example is Singapore uh, because I think the bigger problem with Muslim minority countries uh, we tend to play the victims. We always feel we are helpless. Uh, we cannot do anything. But I think Singapore has proven that they can really do something. Uh, they mobilized themselves in Wakaf. Uh, people started contributing funds and they provided good governance in the way they manage funds. Now look at the billions of funds that Singapore today manage among the small Muslim minorities. They never cried and say, oh, you know, the government is giving us, uh, you know, riba, so we are darura. In fact, they were even more in darura than other people. But still, they refused to allow this idea of darura. They managed to open. And another example is I had a student, master student from Bosnia. He came and told me, he said, you know, all the banking system is conventional. 
Should I go and work there under the ruler? I said, no, go and create your own bank. And truly the brother was determined. He went and created his own uh, enterprise, the first Islamic uh, leasing enterprise. And the brother was appointed as an ambassador. And now he becomes even in uh, a very good position. So my point here is, If we fear Allah sincerely, Allah will open the door. Do you think our situation is so bad, like the situation of the Sahaba of the Prophet وسلم, who migrated from Mecca to Medina, who had almost nothing? Is our situation as bad as the situation of Hagar, the mother of uh, Ismail, uh, 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 when Allah may Allah accept from both of them, Hagar was running in between hills, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. I'm sure we have things on our table, right or wrong. So to me, this explanation of Darura, so that we can go to a comfort zone, I don't buy those explanations. I would still insist that Muslims must come out brave as victors. They must have faith in their religion and say, no, Wallahi, even if it means we'll take 10, 20 years to build our base, we'll build it. I give you another typical example. I was attending a training in South Africa. There were a few brothers from Malawi. They were presenting on their zakah. When they collected their zakah, they just focused only on helping students. Why? Because they said, we had no representative in the government to cater for the needs of the Muslims. So they focused on only one of those asnaf. Believe me, their target was 15 years, but in 10 years, they could achieve what they had targeted in 15 years. They had people in the government representing them, moving forward. So my view here is, we should be al-Muslim al-Qawi, al-Mu'min al-Qawi, a strong Mu'min that should move forward. Not a Mu'min who will always, you know, curve down under Barura and says, you know, our situation is Barura. I don't think our situation is Barura today. We have all the resources, we have the people, we have the means, so let us move forward and say, Assalamu alaikum to Riba, inshallah, we'll build a good Muslim community. That's my answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. There are technical questions from Brother Samsul and Brother Idris. I'll phone oh. to you because it takes time to answer this question. Yeah. Uh, and then also a request uh, for you to maybe to share the, your, your, your response to this Grameen Bank issues. Maybe next uh, time you can forward to me the article or give us the title uh, next yes. time. Yes. Exactly. So we have a few minutes for concluding remark, Prof, for today. Okay, that's very good. Uh, thank you very much for, mashallah, I didn't know that there's quite a huge number of uh, people attending. Jazakumullah khair for sharing this view. But if I were to give a message to all of us, and me included, is Wallahi, Wallahi, and I say even Wallahi several times. There is no shortcut to Islam. Islam started as a strange religion. And in our Akhir Zaman, it will be strange. When you do things, sometimes you even doubt yourself whether you are right or wrong. Because the entire world is going on one side and you're the only person on the other side, you begin to question, am I really right? You become a gharib, you become a stranger in your own deen religion. But, wallahi, when you have Allah by your side, you have faith in your deen, faith in Allah, you will see wonders in your life. So my advice to everybody is, let us try as much as possible to be good Muslims. Unless you reach a level of which the brother calls the rule, you are dying, okay. But so long as you have food on the table, so long as you can go to the mosques, so long as you have time to breathe, you have all the things around you. Please take this word barura and maslaha, put it in your you know, box, uh, put it in your wardrobe, close it, and don't even think about barura. Think about the way forward, inshallah, to move Islam forward as good Muslims. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, such um, motivating uh, classes today, inshallah. Okay. We'll see you again uh, next week, same day, okay. same time. Okay. Uh, I will share the uh, PowerPoint with all the brothers and sisters and then maybe okay. your article on that drumming bank.
Jazakumullah Oke, okay, dan see everyone uh, for next classes. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.